Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this keynote talk. And I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Ivan Aransky of Retraction Watch. Um, and so I'll hand straight over to you, Ivan. Thanks very much, Anna, and really a pleasure to be here and or be wherever we all are. Uh, good morning, uh, good as it is for me. Good afternoon, good evening for those of you who are uh, in obviously in different uh, time zones. So um, I'm just uh, awaiting my PowerPoint coming up. Uh, I see it in one screen. Uh, sorry, I'm going to pin that then. Um, so I want to talk to you today uh, about science and self-correction. This is something that obviously at Retraction Watch we've been thinking about for quite a long time, um, more than 10 years as I'll explain. And I uh, wanna, obviously it's hard not to talk about COVID-19 and the pandemic nowadays, but really put all of what's happening now in context, uh, particularly uh, again, in terms of hundreds of years of scientific publishing. Uh, and so cancer and COVID-19 have the same first letter. So there you go. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so, as you can see, there have been uh, 84, actually, as of this morning, I, I turned these slides in uh, last week, there's been 85 papers retracted, uh, about COVID-19 papers retracted since the beginning of the pandemic, obviously, nothing was being published before that about COVID-19. Um, this sort of is a, it's an interesting number, it's not necessarily a, an important number, except that it sort of grabs people's attention. And so that's really, you know, part of us, our work as journalists is to kind of get people engaged and think about uh, sort of getting their attention. Uh, and a lot of people ask us if I could uh, have the next slide, you know, whether or not that is a sort of significant number. Should we be alarmed by that figure? Uh, this was a letter we wrote to, in response to a short uh, piece of just a few pages in a journal that said that this was an alarming and, you know, exceptionally high figure. Uh, in fact, it's not clear that it is an exceptionally high or even alarming figure. It's about the percent that you would expect of papers being retracted. Uh, however, they're happening much more quickly. And I should say that these, this, this is a mix of preprints uh, as well as uh, sort of you know, peer reviewed papers that are being retracted or withdrawn. Uh, 10 of them are for pure publisher error, uh, something I'll get to in a moment. Uh, so again, there's all sorts of things happening. And I think, if I may, one of the sort of answers to the question about is science self-correcting? Well, it tends to correct a lot when there's a lot of attention. And I'm gonna sort of probably say that a few different times, but if there's one sort of central message, uh, it is that, and that, you know, it doesn't necessarily self-correct all the time, it self-corrects when there's a lot of attention, if I could have the next slide. Um, so, you know, what has happened in COVID-19? I don't think I have to tell anyone in this audience or frankly, anyone at this point in the world that, we have seen a dramatic increase in the speed, uh, the rate of scientific progress, also frankly, scientific errors, but also scientific publishing and the work that people are doing, uh, again, the attention to it, the work that we, uh, me, me as, as journalists are doing and lots of thousands of journalists around the world covering this. So this is a piece from Mother Jones, just you know, pointing out using a metaphor of sports, right, of, of racing, uh, run, uh, road race, um, and so a track race, I should say. So we've taken a marathon, made it into a 400 meter dash. I mean, look, we're already, although there's lots of issues with the rollout of vaccines, we already had a vaccine. Nobody was expecting that. Things have happened. We have several vaccines. Things have happened much more quickly. Um, if I can have the next slide. And so really we have to look at what effect this is having in many, many areas. Again, I mentioned journalism, which is what I do. Uh, public health, uh, public perceptions, all of that. But again, this being the R2R conference, I'm sort of specifically going to look at what this has done to scientific publishing. This is a paper that came out last year. And again, the punchline of it, and you can check the reference for yourself, of course, is that excuse me, the median time from receipt to acceptance of papers about COVID-19 was six days. Now, again, many of you are involved in publishing. Many of you are working at publishers, editors, uh, consultants to publishing. That is the median time. That means not just even the amount of time given to peer reviewers. That's the amount of time from submission to publication. And although, of course, you know, we want to accelerate progress and we want to accelerate dissemination of information, it's hard to sort of imagine that that doesn't have some sort of effect that I think that, you know, many people maybe privately are willing to acknowledge, but publicly often there's a sense that, well, you know, it doesn't have any effect when you speed things up. If I could have the next slide. 
Um, and so again, you know, we, uh, Adam Marcus is my co-founder at Traction Watch, his name will come up again, have written about this. Uh, this was a piece we did in Wired and just wanted to point out, and again, this is not so much for the audience today, but for the general public is really what this is intended for. You know, we are looking at studies that are coming out very, very quickly. And it's like being on an express, you know, there's sort of an express train versus a local train. They both get there at the same time. Excuse me. They both get there eventually. But the point is that one gets there much more quickly. Um, and if you think about that as in terms of where the science is going, um, you know, where are there more likely to be errors? Where are there more likely to be, you know, problems in literature that aren't necessarily picked up? That's one of the main, you know, sort of a main focus for us. If I could have the next slide. So the issue though, and this is what I, why I want to put things in context, this is another piece that Adam and I did for Wired last year. The issue is we have sort of heard, and, and I feel like I'm hearing this a little bit less, which is probably a, a good thing. We've heard this sort of, well, things are very different right now. You know, this is, this is it's a pandemic. Everyone's sort of, it's all hands on deck, whatever your metaphor is. Um, and so, yes, we're speeding things up and it's really, you know, it's just, it's a very different time. I would posit, and I'd be happy to sort of engage in conversation around this because I, I think that it's certainly at least nuanced, if not sort of, there's just a lot of perspectives on this. We've seen all of these trends happening for, for decades, um, you know, whether they're preprints, whether they're frankly huge errors uh, or fraud, uh, which has of course also happened in, in the time of COVID-19. And so, yes, it's certainly ramped up. There, are, There's more of it, but I would again posit that it is in large part because there is so much more scrutiny rather than something dramatically different. Um, these are all major journals, of course, that have retracted in the space of one week, um, three of the world's major medical journals, right? New England Journal, Lancet, and Annals of Internal Medicine all retracted papers uh, in, in the same week in June. And so, but again, they've all retracted papers before and frankly, they will continue to retract papers in the future. If I can have the next slide, please. So, I, I think many of you probably are familiar with the sort of origin story of Retraction Watch. So I'm gonna tell the very brief version here, again, the interest of time so that we can have a robust conversation. I, I think that, you know, 10 years, so it's now 10 and a half years ago that Adam, again, Adam Marcus and I launched Retraction Watch. It was because we saw so many, frankly, good stories as journalists that were hidden in plain sight. They were, there were retraction notices and we were like, well, that's great. We don't have to, you know, rifle through someone's dumpster. Um, uh, we don't have to sort of file public records requests, although we do plenty of that. Uh, we can find these stories, get tips, and then and then investigate them, and that we thought it would be pretty interesting. The other thing we saw, though, that was I think is more relevant here is that a lot of these retraction notices were either empty of devoid of information, or they had you know sort of wrong sort of misinformation or misleading information, um, and we thought that that was a problem in terms of transparency for science, and that's. Again, if there's a sort of bigger picture reason why we launched the blog, that was it. But the other thing we sort of quickly realized, we thought that there were maybe 30 or 40 retractions in the year 2010. And it turns out there were 38, I think, retractions in the year 2000. There were many, many more retractions in the year 2010. And now, if I could have the next slide, we're up to about, there were 1900 retractions last year. Uh, obviously there's a, and I'll talk about the trend line in a, in a moment very briefly. But what that made us realize is, no one was keeping up with this number. No one was keeping up with retraction. We certainly couldn't keep up with it on the blog. And so we created eventually with some uh, very generous funding, a database, which was launched as many of you probably know at the end of 2018. As of today, there, uh, there are more than 24,000 retractions in our database. Um, and that's more than you'll find in any other sort of uh, any other, not, not de database of retractions. There isn't another one, but databases that sort of, you know, nominally should re include retractions or doing, or do include retractions. You can go there, retractiondatabase.org. I'll talk more about the database. Um, but we, you know, very quickly realized that we should, um, you know, keep track of these and include, for example, reasons for retraction as well as other metadata. Uh, these are all added by hand. I want to, I want to emphasize, and that's why uh, it, you know, again, takes resources, of course, to to um, to do this. Uh, next slide, please. Just in terms of some trends, um, again, and, and this is from a piece that was in Science on the journalism side, not the peer-reviewed side, when we launched the database. I, I think you can sort of not so much ignore the fact that you know there's a drop off. There isn't a drop off. That's just that retractions take a while, which is something else I'll get to. Um, the rate of retraction 
you know, in 2018 was roughly four in 10,000 papers, so 0.04%. Um, that was a dramatic increase from 20 years before that. Uh, again, even accounting for the fact that the number of papers has doubled or maybe even tripled in those 20 years, that, you know, the number of retractions had gone up more than 40 fold. And so, and it, they continue to go up. And so, again, it may be leveling off in terms of a rate. Maybe we're reaching quote unquote peak retraction. Um, but you can almost, again, ignore the sort of what happens after because, the, because they take a while. And I, again, I want to just make the point that the vast majority of the, re, the vast reason, majority, excuse me, of the cause for this, we think is because of increased attention. There is some limited, very limited and preliminary evidence that in fact, maybe misconduct is on the rise. The reasons for attraction are also growing. But in fact, what we're seeing is clearly more scrutiny. Everything's online now. Um, you know, frankly, paywalled or not, uh, people have the tools to look at this. There are just many more people looking at it. And frankly, there's a lot more attention being paid to it. If I could have the next slide. Um, so again, I just want to talk about, I'm not going to talk about any of these in particular. I just want to list just to give you a sense of a lot of the reasons for attraction, not in any particular order. Um, some of them obviously much more uh, common than others. Uh, I talked about, I didn't talk about, but fake data was sort of the reason for the, the origin story of Retraction Watch. There was someone named Scott Rubin who had made up all of his data. Uh, and so he, you know, that's on there. A lot of the people with the most retractions in the world, they tend to be because of fake data, but there's lots of other reasons. I'll, I'll just highlight um, a couple. One, fake peer reviews. I think you're all familiar with this story, but this is when people are able to actually peer review their own papers because they submit fake email addresses that look like someone else's email addresses to submission systems. Um, unfortunately, now that we've been writing about this for many years, uh, a lot of those submission systems kind of require checking those email addresses, but this is still happening. And it's responsible for about 4%, about a thousand retractions in our database. It's not a inconsequential number. Um, lots of other reasons. I'll highlight legal reasons just very briefly to say that as you, I think you all know, uh, lawyers have become more and more involved in this process at, at many, many stages. Uh, a lot of researchers who are accused of any wrongdoing sort of treat it like almost like a criminal investigation. And so they hire lawyers. Um, this tends to slow down the process and also make for uh, really what I would say are weasel word uh, retraction notices. If I could have the next slide. Um, so again, just to, this is a bit of a, uh, maybe a graphical representation, about 60% uh, of papers are attracted for something that would be considered misconduct by sort of most definitions, falsification, fabrication, plagiarism. If you add to that things like fake peer review, which aren't quite captured, and if you add to that, you know, lack of IRB approval, things like that, it goes up to more like two thirds. And this is probably hard to see on the screens here. And I apologize for that. But again, it's from the science piece that ran a few years ago. If I could have the next slide. Um, so one of the issues, and uh, I think that this is, you know, sort of, I'm going to get to, again, more, more, I think, evidence of why we, we think that we're not capturing all the retractions is that these take so long. Um, retractions take a really long time. We've seen some recent cases where they take a very short amount of time. That's also interesting. But these are headlines from Retraction Watch. I want to be clear, this is after, these are all after allegations, not after, or in fact, the, the, two of the cases are when Publisher, publishers have received letters from universities, official letters from universities saying, please retract this paper. And they haven't uh, for years. Um, one of the arguments we get often is, well, these things take a long time because we're waiting for universities to do something, to send us an evaluation, to send us an investigation, to send us a request. And yet publishers still don't do anything. We just ran a story last week about a uh, paper in PNAS that the university on official letterhead requested a retraction of two years ago has not been retracted. Um, again, these things take a long time. I know it's often because of lawyers, but there's lots of other issues. Ne next slide, please. So does science self-correct on a geological scale, perhaps you, you could argue and, and science self-corrects whether scientific publishing does, we don't know. Uh, I'll just say briefly, this is an example of one group of researchers who looked at another group's uh, work, they found a lot of issues and less than half of the time did the journals even sort of respond in any substantive way. Um, again, they called it slow, opaque and inconsistent, we would agree. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, this is a, many of you are probably familiar with this piece from, from Nature by David Allison and colleagues from about five years ago now. Punchline is, 
more, you know, about a couple dozen papers that David and his colleagues found issues in, serious statistical issues in, only a third of the time did the, did the journals even respond. Again, are we capturing them all? That 0.04% that we talk about probably should be much higher. I don't know the exact figure, but clearly there are a lot of papers that should be retracted that aren't being retracted. Next slide, please. Um, so again, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the work of, well, lots of people, but this is sort of our leaderboard. We're, we're a bit of sort of frustrated sports journalists. Um, these are people with lots and lots of retractions, of course. We go down to about, right, tied for 30, 31, 32. Um, I just want to point out, this is more popcorn than useful information, but all but one of the people on our leaderboard is uh, a man, right? So there's only one woman on the leaderboard. By the way, she's way at the bottom. I don't remember if it's 28 or 29, something like that. Um, I don't know what to do with that information, but maybe someone smarter than me can figure it out. And this, by the way, is true, even if you control for the sort of overrepresentation of men in positions where they're writing papers. So don't know what's happening there. Interesting little tidbit. Let's go to the next slide uh, in the interest of time here. Um, so I think part of the really, you know, part of the reason we do our work is that uh, is the downstream effects of this sort of quote unquote bad science of, of problematic science, unreliable science. A lot of you again are familiar with these trends, but I'll just highlight them. More than 90% of the time, in fact, in this study, 95% of the time, uh, papers that retracted papers continue to be cited as if they had never been retracted. Right. This is a problem. We've got a bit of a solution for it, which I'll get to in a couple of slides, but uh, this is a problem. Right. So if we're talking about cleaning up the scientific literature, it's bad enough if papers that should get retracted are not getting retracted or getting retracted slowly. Once they are retracted, they continue to be cited. Next slide, please. And this is sort of part of the reason um, is that and, and actually you can go to the, even the next slide. Uh, that's the, that's the title of the paper. But so. This is just one, just looking at a mental health literature, literature mental health, but 40% of the time, you, you, you wouldn't know that the paper had been retracted. The publishers did not mark it in any way. It, did, it didn't get transmitted to, to Medline, to PubMed, to Web of Science, et cetera. 40% of the time, this was worked on by a few librarians, not atypical at all. Uh, we see, and again, this is just one example, but lots of different fields, we see the same thing. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, there's a way to solve this. Um, we, I mentioned our database. If you want free retraction alerts, we partner with Zotero. They actually get a download of our database every day. And then you get a free alert. You don't even have to do anything. Uh, you get a free alert that says, oh, by the way, something in your library has been retracted. Um, we're partnering with other uh, organizations as well, some co companies uh, that are going to be using our database for the same purpose. We've got a bunch online already. I won't mention all of them, but we want these to get out there. We want the, the retraction status to get out there so that you know, we can cut down on, not we, but science can cut down on the amount of waste and, and amount of just citing bad research. Um, so contact me. I think a lot of you may be in a position to do that. Happy to talk uh, later about that. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, again, what, what, is, what are what some of the reasons for this? Again, I mentioned scrutiny. Pubpeer.com, full disclosure, I'm on the volunteer board of directors there. I think you're all familiar with pubpeer.com. If you're not, go check it out. People can leave comments. Tends to be, well, if I'm being kind, uh, sometimes a bit annoying to uh, publishers, to editors who say, well, you know, I get all these allegations. I don't know what to do with them. Do something with them. I guess that's the, that's sort of my, that would be my plea. But again, this has led to lots of retractions and corrections. If I could have the next slide. Um, as have a lot of other trends um, in terms of sleuths, right? And so um, Elizabeth Bick, I think you've probably all heard of Elizabeth Bick. If you haven't, please find out about Elizabeth, uh, as well as Nick Brown and James Heathers. Uh, Elizabeth looks at images, image manipulation. Nick Brown, Nick and James look at uh, statistical anomalies. We have a list of more than 20 different sleuths. These are the folks who are responsible for many, many retractions uh, and many corrections and just people actually paying attention to what's going on in the literature. They're critical to the infrastructure. Frankly, they should all be funded in some way. Um, if I can get to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and so, you know, and again, well, actually this is just an example of, again, someone doing the right thing. This is sort of a positive message. Somebody saying, somebody coming forward in what could be a very risky situation, coming forward a graduate student saying, hey, you know, there's something wrong and turns out she was right. They retracted the paper. Lots of good things happened. You may have read about this story. Next slide, please. Um, 
So again, some of you who are represented here are probably among uh, those publishers who are actually hiring what were referred to as Reacher's Integrity czars here. Uh, again, people who are really sleuths, but sort of on the payroll of the publishers. Um, uh, you know, some publishers like Febs has been doing this uh, for a long time. Um, the journals, I should say, this is a sign of change, a good sign of change. And I'll show you another one in the next slide, um, which is that people are actually, again, coming forward about issues they find even in their own literature, in, in their own papers. So this is a case that you've probably heard something about involving uh, Jonathan Pruitt, a researcher, a spider researcher in Canada. Um, this was the first retraction that happened because of that case. This is a co-author of his, again, a junior faculty member who had a lot to risk by coming forward about the mistake, but actually not only did she go and have the paper retracted, request the paper be retracted, she went public with it, wrote a blog post about it, why it was so important to her, excuse me, into the field to have a, you know, this retraction run. And now there've been, I think the current low double digits in terms of not hers, but just all of the Jonathan Pruitt's retraction. So next slide, which I, I'm pretty sure is my last one. I just want to, again, acknowledge some of our generous uh, donors. That's my contact information, but look forward to questions. And then I know we'll be at the, uh, in the great hall uh, at, on the hour. So uh, over to you, Anna. Great, thank you very much, uh, Ivan. Um, we've got several questions. We may have time for a few anyway. Um, so one from Kim Eggleston. Fake peer review is a really worrying trend. Any thoughts on how publishers can tackle this? She suggests insisting on institutional emails excludes multiple countries where using these are not the norm. So how do we verify that the email address belongs to the right person? Right. So, you know, as, as I'm sure you all know, a lot of the sub submission system, manuscript submission systems have uh, have done a pretty good job of tackling this. They require that the editor actually check the email address or at least acknowledge that they should do that. Um, I think it's, it is a pressing question, but you know, I mean, orchid, I, orchids are one way to try and get at this. Um, you know, frankly, a lot of submission systems, I peer review an occasional paper here and there. And, you know, I use my personal email address cause it's, I do have an institutional one, but people, I guess, know who I am. They, they verified that email address some way we can do, you know, multi-factor authentication when I, log into, I don't know, every single thing I log into, I don't think it's unreasonable to say, let's do that with, you know, with something with peer review. Yeah, why not? Sounds a good point. Um, we've got one actually from Mark Carden. Um, I've seen a lot of people criticizing the high quality claims of expensive journals on the grounds they have high retraction rates, but high rates can mean sloppy vetting, vetting or good follow-up and transparency. How to disentangle what a retraction rate actually means. Yeah, I, well, I, I would say, I mean, if I'm being uh, sort of maybe glib about it, retraction rate means almost nothing. Um, I think that, uh, and, and maybe that sounds strange coming from the co-founder of Retraction Watch, but it's what I've always said. And here, here's the retraction rate that, I, that gives me pause, which is zero. So a journal that has been in existence for more than 20 minutes and has never retracted a paper, I'm pretty concerned. I don't mean 20 minutes, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that. Um, you know, and, and so there, there are journals that, steadfastly say, see, we've never had to retract anything into which I say, that's, that's really interesting. And I've never made a mistake in my life. So you should really trust me. Um, no, it's so I think that a lot of the high retraction rate is again, because of attention, maybe because of competition to get into that journal. But you know, and, and this goes back 10 years now, the retraction index, there's a sort of in our world famous paper showing exactly what Mark is talking about a, you know, if you if you look at if you chart retraction rate versus impact factor, it's, it's a fairly linear relationship. Um, and again, I, I, maybe this is even glib on the other side of things. I think that journals should be proud of high retraction rates. And it's, you know, it means that they're actually paying attention. I don't think we have reached peak retraction. And so, you know, if you have more than average, you probably still don't have quite enough, but at least you're doing something about it. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting because there definitely have been people saying, oh, the high, high impact means high retraction. So that's bad. So that's very right. And again, but again, I and, and the risk of sort of totally overgeneralizing, you know, scientific publishing, like every other human endeavor, is incredibly tribal. And so, you know, when you see something like that and you don't like impact factor, which frankly, I, I see a lot of arguments not to like impact factor, you find it as a way to sort of use that as a cudgel. I, I think you're I think that's I'll be I'll be polite, but I think that's misplaced. Um, I do think it's interesting to look at, but again, I would sort of look at high retraction rates as a good thing. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Phil Jones. 
To what extent does pressure on researchers lead to a general downward, downward pressure on research diligence and over-interpreting data? Is there a gray area of people who may not even realize they're doing something wrong? Oh, absolutely. And, and again, I mean, it's a great question, Phil. I mean, I, you know, clearly the incentive structure, which I didn't talk much about, but I think everyone is familiar with, uh, obviously has a great uh, plays a great role here. And so and at every stage of that, I wrote a piece five or six years ago now um, where I, I sort of talked about the fact that, and again, I included journalists sort of at the end, if you will, this sort of end of the traje trajectory the narrative. At every stage, the incentives are pointing in the wrong direction, right? They're misaligned. And so, you know, once you publish a paper, you then have to defend it to the death because it is what you get judged on. So I, I think there are plenty of people who either and again, I don't think that training will do everything because it's really mentorship and it's sort of just this sense of, you know, but if you continue the incentives the way they are, uh, it's going to be a really continued to be an uphill battle, which is why to, to get back to this impact factor and Dora, I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, it's different ways that, um, you know, and I know China came up uh, at least in one of the workshops that I was uh, listening in on this morning. Um, they've made a lot of changes recently. Uh, in a way that, frankly, uh, you can do when you're an authoritarian government um, uh, that perhaps most of the rest of us, you know, can't necessarily see in our own uh, uh, situations. Um, but that's going to be really interesting to watch. And I think that it's one of those cases. It's almost a, a field experiment, natural experiment of what can happen when we try at least to realign the incentives. Mm. Uh, there's an interesting question from Jane Alfred. Um, to help clean up the literature, do we need different types of retractions, a new way of referring to retractions and or changing the t tone of the conversation from being something negative to being something positive? Well, I, we, we do. I, I would probably take issue, and again, in the interest of time, I'll be brief here, but I would probably take issue with sort of the relabeling phenomenon, which comes up every few years. Uh, you know, frankly, publishers have used that, I think, in ways that actually take a, you know, limit transparency. They, you know, oh, we call it a withdrawal, so we don't have to give a reason for retraction. At the end of the day, and what we've said literally since day one of Retraction Watch is clear retraction notices do so much more than trying to relabel it and then fit it into some other sort of allegedly non-binary system. You know, so, you know, if it's retracted, I don't actually care what you call it, although I think we should just have one term personally. Mm -hmm have a clear attraction notice. It's actually very clear in the literature that when you do that, if it is an honest error, if it is something where the, journal, the, the researcher came forward, the authors came forward, they don't have a penalty. So in fact, what's important is the, the prose. It is not the label. And so I would say just focus on clear and, 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 and sort of unambiguous and also uh, detailed retraction notices. I think that'll take us a long way. Great, well, that's a good point to stop, I think. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan. It's been very enlightening and uh, thank you for answering all those questions. And yeah, um, Ivan and I will be in the Great Hall in spatial chat in the networking system at the start of the next break. So the start of the next hour, um, as in the o'clock, three o'clock my time. Um, and so if anyone wants to come and ask him any more questions, then you can continue in, uh, discussing this topic by, by joining us there. Um, please do complete your feedback surveys on this session. And we're now going to set up the panel on research realities, which will be ready to start in a few minutes. So if you want to start this session, go to the timeline and se se select that agenda item. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anna.